Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of medical technology. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Nicoljohn. And we're your hosts of the show. So today we are delighted to be joined by Alexander Colton, CEO and co-founder of Cosmos Pharmaceuticals. Alexander, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me today. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we're delighted to have you. This is ideal timing just off the back of the most recent impact event just last week when we're doing this recording. So I think before, as always, when we kick things off, we want to share the mission and the problem that Cosmos Pharmaceuticals is looking to solve. So please tell us. Absolutely, Richard. Thanks for the question. So I started this company in really tragic beginnings after one of my best friends passed away from an overdose of prescription medication. And I think since then, in going through the M2D2 impact program, we've come to understand the issue of medication non-adherence and how it has a negative impact on patients' lives across disease states. And so the focus of my company is to monitor medication adherence between doctor visits and use our data-driven insights and our medication adherence platform to better educate patients on their treatment plan and also help them understand how they can handle adverse events, symptoms, and side effects, and communicate that information to their provider in real time. So if there is anything the provider can do to help, they'll be in the mix and able to reach out to the patient in real time. That's that's the goal of the company right now. So a really important mission, and of course, we're sorry for your loss, uh, which has led to where you are. Tell us more about medication adherence. You know, where are we in terms of the stats today? Yeah, absolutely. So in the United States, um, at a very high level, medication adherence is something that impacts all of us. We all eventually will have a prescription medication where in the United States, there's 4.2 billion prescriptions a year covering a multitude of disease states. And when I think about non-adherence, it has specific impacts on patients where it takes roughly 125,000 lives a year, excluding lives lost from the opioid crisis and mental health crisis. And it also is a huge cost where roughly... Each year is different, but hundreds of billions of dollars go into healthcare costs and associated costs of loss of productivity and things like that due to non-adherence. So the real issue is that understanding that when a patient goes to see a doctor, they're getting a treatment plan. And if they don't follow that treatment plan, it'll either exacerbate their symptoms or land them right back where they were, you know, 30 days or 90 days ago when they were seeing that doctor for the original issue. And I don't think patients have a good way of managing medication adherence right now. And so, yeah, tell us more about the, the standard of care, like what's happening now and when, where are we failing? Yeah, so I think if I segmented medication adherence into a couple of different populations, I would look at elderly care as where everybody goes to think about medication adherence, right? Is those neurodegenerative patient populations, people living in elderly care facilities and the like. And those, those patients struggle because of forgetfulness. They struggle because of socioeconomic reasons. They also struggle because of the multitude of medications that they need to take. If you're on Medicare and above the age of 65 in America, you're taking on average seven to 11 prescriptions, and that could be up to six different times a day. So those are very, very different things and, and difficult to manage. And then from there, it becomes easier and easier, in my view, as you get younger and younger. But nonetheless, medication adherence is something where once a patient gets a prescription medication, if they don't take it, that'll exacerbate their symptoms. But if they start to take it and take it in a way that isn't consistent with the doctor's regimen, that's where there's going to be a disconnect between the doctor and the patient. And nobody's going to understand why certain symptoms and side effects are taking place and how to better care for that patient at the next checkup. So when I think about that and I look at our focus and our beachhead market of young adult mental health patients, our main focus is that real-time data to help educate patients. So if you're taking an anti-anxiety medication in college, and it's your first time, to really help you understand that if you take it for 30 days and you're feeling better, now is the time to continue taking it. Now is not the time to say, okay, I'm feeling better. And without telling my doctor or anybody involved in my care circle that I'm going to stop taking it, because that's where we see really, really bad things happen. And just a little aside, you know, you guys asked me why I started the company, and it was because I had such close personal relationships with my friends and, and their struggles with addiction. But I think medication adherence is such a vast market, and so a much more realistic example of something that I never would have thought about unless it was something that happened in my home. But my dad had, I don't want to say a heart attack, but a, a serious cardiac event. Um, and so when we got our first devices finished up about a year ago, 
he had a prescription for a high dose blood pressure medication in the home. And it was so shocking because my dad's a smart guy and I thought he would take it on time like he was supposed to. But we put him on a cap and he was messing the prescriptions up a little bit too. And his number one issue was to say something like, I think I took it. I don't know if I took it. I have to go to work. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going, I got work to do. And so, you know, I get my work ethic naturally and honestly from my dad, but I think that that was where we saw, okay, forgetfulness is something that will degrade a treatment plan. And we can impact that in a very positive way with alerts and reminders and that sense of education of, hey, you took it this morning. And so both from alerts and reminders perspective, but the device itself, when you scan your fingerprint, it'll unlock to you. But for my dad, one of the things we built in the firmware was this idea of if you scan it and you're only taking a prescription one time in a day in the morning, that the second time you scan it, the light turns blue now. And it's significant because it says to a patient, you already took your prescription today. You don't need to. If you needed another dose, he would scan his fingerprint a third time and that would unlock the device. But these very simple passive reminders of just helping somebody understand what they haven't and have done in a day, that's where I see the biggest impact for medication adherence. This is not a massive issue of like, how are we going to solve this problem? It's very simple. It's it's similar to making sure we drink the right amount of water and eat the right food every day to make sure we're, we're healthy. That's all we're talking about here. Yeah, Alexander, that's fantastic. And, and you and Richard just did such a great job uh, diving into the problem there and gave some really great examples too, uh, that I feel like are incredibly relatable. So I guess, Let's speak a little bit more about your technology. You started to kind of get into it there at the end, um, but how are you seeking to address, you know, this problem and kind of w- what does your product and in, in service look like? How does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, were the company itself. I think you can think of Cosmos as a data, data aggregation company where we focus on data driven analytics, but we have a device enabled platform. So we provide a Fortis cap device to patients taking prescription medications, and that device helps generate the data needed on a platform for them to see their medication adherence in real time and understand their treatment plan. And the, the three significant things that Cosmos does that's very separate from the market, in my opinion, is that focus on communication. That link between the patient and provider is absolutely critical. And that's why we have a platform and that's why our platform integrates with mobile applications. It'll integrate with web portals. It'll integrate with your EHR system so that everybody in the mix is is connected. I don't think that there's something more important than a patient's treatment plan for prescription medications that'll drive healthcare outcomes. Unless you're getting in a car accident or, you know, you you have a broken leg. Those are very straightforward symptoms and is very serious, but prescriptions won't help there. Mm-hmm. The general care of populace, that's where we think medication adherence drives an impact. And that's where the platform comes in. And then the reason we're special is not because we have a platform, right? Because everybody can build a platform. It's that data that goes into the platform that helps us understand our patients. So our device uses a fingerprint sensor to secure medication to an individual and identify them. And so once you're registered on our device as a user, you can add on additional people like mom, dad, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be. But then we record what time a patient opens it and who they are. And that's that time of opening that everybody in the market's focused on, right? That's understanding, okay, what's the chronological order of events of how you took your treatment? Beyond that though, we get the dosing quantity. And I think that's the most important thing that really drives home this understanding of treatment in prescriptions is I need to know who you are, your age, weight, gender. I also need to know when you take your medication. And that's where we stopped as a market. That was the requirement to get into the remote therapeutic monitoring reimbursements and the requirement to start monitoring medication. And it makes a lot of sense for neurodegenerative populace because generally they're just not taking it and they're forgetful of their prescriptions. However, Mm -hmm. Dose and quantity, when we think about mental health patients, when we think about cardiovascular patients dealing with high blood pressure and things like that, specifically when we think about ADHD and pain medicine, that dose and quantity is the number one driver of a patient not dealing well with their treatment plan. And to link the dosing time and the dosing quantity is our special feature. Mm -hmm. And then from there, bringing in your medical record and your physician and understanding on the platform, okay, you're at a 300% increase from what you're supposed to be doing. And you've been doing that for six days. Are you going to have physical withdrawal symptoms on a pain prescription? Potentially, but we can start to look into those facts now. And beforehand, I mean, quite frankly, all we really have in the market right now is when a patient picks up their prescription and when they pick up the refill and everything in between is totally lost. 
Yeah, th this is this is great. And and so your product specifically, so there's a hardware side, there's a software side. The hardware side, it, what you're saying is a cap, a cap that goes on to a pill bottle. Is that right? Any pill bottle at any pharmacy in the country. Okay. And, you know, I'm curious here, you made a comment and I want to try and um, I want to make sure I'm not misunderstood and I want this to be clear to the audience, but does it monitor the amount of medication that's coming out of the bottle too? Yes. It does. How does it do that? It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so this is one of those things that I think we're just excited that it, it took place in the company, but we use an array of different sensors inside the cap and it all comes back into object detection and image segmentation algorithms on our server. So we get this raw data package essentially on the device at each opening event from a patient. And then that's sent to our server where we process that raw data and then we get an estimate of how many pills. And that estimate is incredibly accurate right now between zero and 30 pills, which is the primary prescription dosage for most patients. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that is fa fantastic. I um, just think about, you know, pain medication or really any medication that could be abused, right. And, and used in the wrong way. And, you know, that was a concern that I had when just listening to you describe your technology, but, you know, and I think about people that might be, you know, starting to become addicted to opioids, you know, and you find that, whoa, you're, you're taking these way too quickly and you're taking too many of them. You know, there's a problem here. We need to address that. Is there any kind of privacy concerns too regarding the ability to track the drugs, uh, maybe potentially, you know, the patient taking more than they, they should? There, there are privacy concerns in the sense that we have an incredibly large focus at Cosmos on our cybersecurity protocols and how we store patient data to make sure that nothing goes awry with patient data. But when I think about the treatment plan, our entire focus is on improving the ability of a patient to take care of themselves on their own. And so I wouldn't say that if a patient has a prescription for oxycodone, say they're, they're a patient coming out of the VA and they have an oxycodone prescription, they're over consuming that to a significant degree. That's not going to put them into a bucket of like, this is a problem patient, we're not going to treat them anymore. That's going to put them into the bucket of this guy or girl has significant pain. And we need to determine if it's acute or chronic. And then from there, we need to understand what's the best treatment plan for that patient. And in some cases, Kyle, I must say, I've met some individuals that take, in my opinion, a large amount of pain prescriptions. They're in a large amount of pain. Um, so there's that side of life too. And I never want to say, you know, like if you just look at somebody like you're not in pain and then you start talking to them and they're like, I have 17 pieces of shrapnel in my lower back. It's like, all right, you are. I understand yeah, yeah. that side of life. And so I would say it's very difficult and something we never plan to do to judge a patient. And, and I'm not putting words in your mouth. I would say judge is my word, but we, we want to understand them. And so I think that's where I would say, even if we look at the severe case of, you know, a, a college student who's, you know, in addiction right now, and, you know, like a functioning drug addict, essentially, if we identified a patient like that, what are the steps we can take to help them is the question, not, all right, this dude's a risk, we're going to kick him out of our treatment plan. Yeah. It's much yep. more, all right, this guy needs help. How do we help them? Fantastic. This is hugely powerful. I mean, like Kyle, I'm sure all the listeners can relate to this. You know, the potential to forget or miss a pill, even when you're on a simple seven-day plan. If you're taking antibiotics, that's easy enough to do. And to your point, Alexander, if you're taking multiple tablets, you know, it's, it could be so easy for an older person to lose track of what they're doing. And then, of course, that's before we even start to touch on the whole overdose or, or overtaking medication. I'm now intrigued to learn more about your go-to-market strategy. And when I'm thinking about this, you know, Kyle summarized nicely the question around the cap. So how does the cap fit into the current business model in terms of surely that's going to be an extra cost, of course, to a standard bottle? And, and how do you fit into that whole reimbursement? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're going to have a very strategic approach to entering the market and I don't know, maybe surprisingly to me, but unsurprisingly to some, some, you know, experts in the market, the number one issue of how we scale the company deals around the geographic location of patients. So when I think about it, the reimbursement package that's available is the remote therapeutic monitoring reimbursement package. And that is something we can access as long as we record 
16 of 30 days of the time at which a medicine container is open for a patient. And that onboarding process is onboarding them to the device. So those are the two codes, 98976 and 77 are for Cosmos. And then the other two are 98980 and 81. And those are for the clinicians to do the clinical care time. But those reimbursements are what makes the device cost neutral for a hospital system and free to a patient. And it definitely helps us enter the market. The one thing that we saw in the market is other medical devices, other prescriptions, and the location of a patient. Those really drove how we identified our market. And what I mean by that is if we look at the average 50 year old, male cardiovascular patient in America, they might have, you know, four to seven prescriptions, and they might have a medical device already. And so when I think about that, we don't want to compete with other medical devices in the billing practices in the beginning. And we certainly don't want to provide six to 10 devices to a patient when we only can bill for one device. And so our focus is on young adult mental health patients coming out of a hospital system. And the reason for that is because young adults under the age of 26 typically have zero medical devices. Maybe they have crutches. Um, they also have one, maybe two prescriptions. And that's typically the primary prescription prescribed for their issue. Maybe that's anxiety unspecified. And then a, a filler prescription. Maybe it's a sleep prescription or an SSRI to help kind of stabilize the symptoms of their primary prescription. And when I look at that, that makes that patient an ideal patient for us from the billing perspective. But then onboarding that patient and having them stay with us so that we don't have a high attrition rate of patients using the device for a month and then saying, I'm, I'm good here. That's where we look at hospital patient departments, where we can provide our device to hospital pharmacies. And then the patient, the prescribing doctor, and the pharmacy filling the prescriptions in one building. That solves all of our problems in the beginning. So that's our go-to beachhead market space. And then from there, as we expand, we'll expand from the hospital pharmacy to the three to five pharmacies surrounding the hospital, the primary pharmacies that patients go pick up their prescriptions if they can't get it at the hospital. And then from there, we see payer adoption driving us really getting into that retail pharmacy market. And that's something we look to take place between, you know, first half of 2025 is really our goal for that retail pharmacy adoption. And you covered there quite a few different stakeholders. So obviously we're talking about the patient, we're talking about the person prescribing the drugs, we're talking about there potentially could be, you know, a secondary caterer involved in this process. So what's that learning been like from getting feedback from them, uh, particularly the care professionals? Yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey understanding tracking a dollar through the healthcare market space. I think I'd track a dollar through any other industry before I did it in healthcare again. But I would say that when we talk to physicians, they're our, they're our champion. Um, if there's one individual in this mix that's incredibly excited about our solution, it would be the physicians. Because I'd say on average, 80% of the time, patients are having an issue or going back to their doctor or entering an ER because of non-adherence to their prescription treatment plan. And so when I think about physicians and the benefit we bring to them, it's really that understanding of like, all right, does my patient have a new issue? Or is this the old issue that we're not dealing with in a good way? That's where physician adoption is the highest for us right now. And they're really getting us into the hospital systems that we're trying to work with. Now, the pharmacist involved is the most difficult aspect of this scenario because of the training required to help a pharmacist understand how to onboard a patient. Where do we store the devices? Do we need to pay for our own storage of the devices? Things like that. And then more importantly, what happens when the device is returned to a pharmacy? And what happens if it's returned with prescriptions left in the bottle? And how do we handle the cleaning and you know refurbishing essentially of a device? Now we've worked out the majority of these with pharmacists where I think there's gonna be a two-pronged approach. One is that we'll agree to help them with their supply chain where pharmacies can only have so many prescriptions on the shelf at one time for one treatment. And if they have say 20 patients and we're tracking all 20 and we see that 16 aren't ready for a refill but their internal pharmacy system says all 20 are, that's where that supply chain management becomes much better. And if the pharmacist has one difficult aspect of the job that they worry about, it's that quarterly review from the DEA or the FDA to audit them and see how they're dealing with their supply chain. Now, the other side of it is I think we can incentivize pharmacists with payment plans where based on the number of patients they have using our device, we can pay them per, per patient basis to help them with the training process and with the patients. Now, all of that, allows us to have a hospital system, bill reimbursements, pay us a fee, 
generate revenue for a hospital system and better manage their patients. The, the goal here, nonetheless, is to get this sponsored by payers. And so when we think about how to do that, it really comes with those clinical outcomes and the outcome data that we can report to payers. And so I'd say we need to work through this process for at least the next six to 12 months with our hospital system clients before we get into that stage where the whole system becomes much more simple and it's provided through a payer instead of us going through this process that I just described. For Kyle, it sounds like that, you know, what on paper it might be a really simple task of just taking a certain number of ta tablets suddenly becomes a pretty complex process. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, Alexander started touching on a lot of the regulatory and reimbursement pathway. And, you know, I, I guess when you look at your hardware and your software, you've, you've made um, some great observations. You shared a lot of great insights with us, but what does the regulatory pathway look for that, for the cap there? It sounds like, you know, you're doing a lot of work with these physicians, with the hospitals, with the payers, but I guess, not just the hardware, but the software side too. I guess, how are you approaching, you know, that regulatory journey? Yeah, so I think we have a, a three-staged approach to this right now. We're very fortunate that FortisCap in its infancy, the devices that we have right now are a class one device. And so we'll pay our facility registration fee and that'll allow us to enter the market. And that's because the device isn't interoperable. We're not sending information two ways between the patient and the physician. We're simply taking in information from the patient and referring it to a physician and then vice versa. And so in this beginning stage, our goal is medication management. How can we better establish baselines for patients and improve upon that baseline so that they have the best medication adherence record that they, they could have? And then as we substantiate those claims, I think one of the things I see in the market is a move away from patient reported data. So when I think about medication adherence and what a lot of companies are doing right now, there is a very quick pathway to market where you can build a mobile application and get patient reported data on prescription medications of how are you doing today? What's going on with your mood? Have you taken your prescriptions? And we've also seen some pretty catastrophic failures in the market when it comes to patient reported data, specifically referring to the IPO of paratherapeutics and them going out of business where they had two great indications on pain medicine and then really ended up going belly up mainly because patients don't always report the correct patient information of, yes, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? It's, um, I don't want to say it's almost natural, but it feels natural when I go to my doctor to tell them, yeah, I'm doing what you asked me to, you know, it's, it's almost like telling the teacher, like, yeah, I did my homework and I know I did it because you're not going to ask for it today. You know, there's no way to check on that. But that gets us to stage two. And I think when I think about stage two and where we want to go moving forward, it's that clinical implications where we would in-house a clinical care team to better manage patients. And what I mean by that is there's a predictive aspect to the algorithm development we have where we take in this data. And so eventually when we get to a disease state where we have historical data on enough patients, we can use that data to start making inferences on where we think patients will go in the future. And those predictive inferences that we want to make will require us to be a class two device for interoperability, where instead of saying, hey, doc, we see this patient doing this over the past four days, it would rather than be Cosmos saying, in the past, we've seen 25 patients go down this, this road, so to speak. And once they end, they're going to have an adverse event or they're going to have another diagnosis of something else. And so can we have a predictive nature and in real time prevent that from taking place? That's my goal for stage two, and that will require a class two um, approval for our device. And then in the long run, what I really see is this home health, right? We all hear about this 360 degree of a patient in the home and how we can improve home health of a patient. And so I see whether it's a, a, a group effort or if Cosmos can lead the charge on this to bring in other devices like medical scales, thermometers, blood pressure medications, or monitors for medications, and, and to bring that data in so that we can have a complete understanding of a patient. And that's where the predictive aspect really comes into play, right? If we can have all of this data streaming in real time on a patient, we can get a pretty good sense of what's going to happen with that patient. And that's where I see the market headed, right? With this, this kind of onset of AI and everybody likes that buzzword of AI. AI in my mind is the ability to accurately predict the future. And that's something where we're going to use pattern recognition and a lot of things like natural language processing to look at medical records and doctor notes, and then to say, okay, we think this is what's going to happen with this patient. 
I see that as the the long run view of Cosmos and where we want to be in the market. If we think about the company in you know three or four years from now, that that's what I see taking place. That's fantastic. And you know, you did touch on the reimbursement. You know, what's that ideal pathway look like then? Because it sounds like you know you're going to go from class one to class two. It sounds like you're focused really on that class one device over what you mentioned previously that next six to twelve months, um, you know, time. So. I guess, you know, how, and it sounds like there's a lot of data, right, that you're kind of gathering here and submitting to these payers. So um, can you touch a little bit more on that reimbursement? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when I think about the remote therapeutic therapeutic monitoring reimbursement, it came out in January of 2022. It was a relatively new reimbursement package. And the focus was on the public health emergency of COVID, right? This lack of ability to access physician care, to go to your local pharmacy, patients were receiving prescriptions in the mail, and, and there needed to be a way to help those patients deal with their prescription plans. And so that allowed for this patient reported data to be reimbursable. And I think naturally that'll go away in the next three to six months when we look at the fee schedules that'll naturally transition into something of a quantitative metric of saying we need a device to say okay a patient opened this device at this time or we need something more tangible like a video recording or something like that where we could really see what's going on mm. and I think that our goal at Cosmos is to use these reimbursements, right? Because we do do this with our device. But beyond that, we have a couple clinical trials that we're setting up right now, one with William Mary, one with University of Delaware, and ideally we'll set up one with the VA as well. And that goal is to make the argument to the FDA that we raise the standard of care for remote therapeutic monitoring, and we bring a data package that's better than what's required. And that data would be, like I said, who you are, when you open your device, and how many pills you take out of it. And if we can raise that standard of care requirement, that's really where I see us best positioned in the market. But just to be clear, changes are coming to RTM and probably to RPM as well. They're not going anywhere, though. They're going to stay here for good. And so we just really want to make sure we bring the best offering to our patients so that we can stick with that reimbursement package and don't have to go through the process of getting our own CPT codes. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are doing a great job at kind of seeing where the industry is at today and in understanding what what will be needed in the future and, you know, how you're aligning Fortacap on your, your product and service. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but all of this doesn't come without challenges, you know. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, Kyle. I was just thinking we, exactly that. You yeah, know, we, we always easy. dive into this. You know, we always talk about the challenges. It's kind of a tough conversation, but, you know, it's a big part of all of this. Yeah, and there's two that jump out to me. I mean, just Alexander, I wonder if you could circle back and maybe start with one and then I'll come on to the second one. But the first one you mentioned there was interoperability. You know, how are you finding that? Because it seems to be the elephant in the room when we're thinking about delivering new technologies. So how's it been for Cosmos? I, I think um, the term vaporware comes to mind, but we have had so many conversations. And in my experience personally, right, because I started this company coming out of college. And so I would join a lot of online classes. I remember COVID 2019, 2020, I was just listening to people speak on interoperability left and right. And it's this idea of an interconnected and shared data process where we can understand medical records and patient information across a spectrum of care. And it doesn't seem to be coming to fruition on the on the timeline that was was proposed to the industry, where some of the issues we've seen are that inside of a single hospital system, different departments have siloed data information. And so if you're a pain medicine patient that then goes to psychiatric care for, you know, bipolar disorder totally separate data sets, not connected. And so when I think about it, I think it's really going to be on the, the companies that house this data. When I think about, you know, Epic and Cerner and the ability of an EHR to connect this, that's where they need to, to lead the charge because hospital systems have a hard enough time right now after COVID and the public health emergency and just staying above water, let alone integrating a whole new, you know, software system and a software development team to maintain it and to educate everybody in the system on how the new platform works, it needs to be something that occurs in the back end. And it can't be something where everybody needs to relearn a new process. And so when I think about it that way, it's going to be on companies like Cosmos. It's going to be on, on companies that are growing up in the industry and coming in to say, all right, we don't have an expertise in clinical care. We have an expertise in data. 
And so how can we use this data to improve the clinicians and their ability to care for patients? Because I, I, I've witnessed this a couple of times in Cosmos, but the value of the right piece of information at the right time is priceless. I mean, it, right? Like if you're in a presentation to an investor or if you're in a big meeting and you're like, oh, that's what I need to say right now. I mean, that's so important. And so for a doctor, if a doctor said, I'm not really sure why you're having these problems. Oh, it's definitely because of your medication adherence. That's where I see interoperability really coming in is companies like mine and bigger companies, the leaders in the industry like Epic and Cerner saying, all right, who needs to know what, when, and how can we better provide that to them? That's where the collaboration really needs to take place, I think. And all too often in healthcare, I've seen people say, all right, I'm not going to tell you anything about what I do. And, and I think that's actually been one of the big benefits that Cosmos has experienced is me and my co-founder, Joe, um, we're team players, man. We, we want to help. I mean, the whole goal of the company was to help not to make a ton of money or do anything like that. So when I think we have these conversations with interoperability, we're typically like, this is the data we have. And we need that data from you. And we'd like to push it all into this one server. Is that possible? Typically, the answer is yes. It's just why. And so if we could better educate everybody on why we need this, then I think everybody would be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. We can do it. But but I'd still say we're far away from being interoperable in, in the United States healthcare market. But that word collaboration is key. And I, th and I think you guys are taking the right approach to this. The, the other second point I wanted to come on to was just around competition, because as you mentioned, reimbursement came out in January 2022. And there's been a lot of sort of Me Too products coming out in the you know, it's a competitive space. Um, you've got the likes of Repair Therapeutics, unfortunately, didn't make it. So how have you found that differentiation uh, and just sort of rising above what else is in the marketplace? I think there's three sides of life. Um, one is understanding where we want to fit in the market. So one of the things we've touched on in, in this today is elderly care. And so when I think about elderly care, I think about my grandmother and the prescription she takes and how there is a company, Hero Health, that does a phenomenal job of monitoring a bunch of prescriptions at the same time. And then there's PillPack on top of that, that will also do a pretty good job of monitoring multiple prescriptions at the same time. PillPack doesn't come with that data collection aspect that Hero Health does. But I'd say that's the first thing Cosmos thinks about when we think about competition is who are we competing with? And, and 4.2 billion prescriptions is a lot of prescriptions. And we'd like to focus on our, our niche in the market. The second thing that comes to mind about competition is who are we going to have to compete with in the future? Not right now. And that gets back to where's the market headed and what are the requirements to participate in the game, so to speak, making sure that we focus internally on bringing the best product to market rather than saying, oh, they're doing that. Let's, let's do that too. Just focusing on our lane. Um, but then competition in my mind and the thing that's most important is talking to the customers. Um, that's where I would say we've noticed in a couple of the, the customer relationships we have in the study that we just did, that everybody wants something different. And so how can you have one product that fits a lot of different markets? That's, that's the key thing that I think Cosmos focused on and executed on that others didn't is when I use an example of a college student taking you know, a prescription like Adderall. It's like, all right, we can secure that. We can lock it up. We can prevent access to it unless they open it one time per day. And then I think about examples like my dad. And it's like, all right, we just want to help this guy understand if he did or didn't take it today. So the ability to program different firmware packages in our device to fit and cater to different patients is a real key for us. And that helps us to expand our market from just our beachhead of mental health into other categories. And I think when other companies say, well, we have a mobile application and we can expand that. Well, I have a mobile application and I can expand mine too. And it really falls on that understanding of what's patentable, what's IP in a company and what can you protect versus what can everybody do? And it just comes down to who can do it faster and better. And typically I'd like to think that, you know, IP is IP. We have our device patented and there's not a lot more we can do there right now, but that comes to a team. And that's the last thing I would say on competition is, it's just like playing, you know, a basketball game in high school or a lacrosse game. It's like, all right, those those are the guys right there across the field. You have a pretty good sense before you start the game if you're going to win or lose. And that's entirely dependent on your team. And so I I think we have a big focus on building a team that can get the job done rather than anything else, because because that's who's going to be getting the job done, right? Like late at night when a problem happens, you're either going to solve it or you're not going to solve it. And 
that's what that's that's so important that that team 100 percent yeah 100 percent kyle you know what's coming through loud and clear is that alexander's ability to compartmentalize the different elements of what needs to be done and so i think about when you're in a startup you just have a myriad of things to do and so yeah. focus <laughs> is the key thing i saw Siva from jungle health who was part of the same program posting just yesterday saying you know it's the hardest thing sometimes to say is just no and so I think that's what comes through loud and clear is you have this focus. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree, Richard. And I'm thinking the same, especially Alexander, with everything that you're doing over there. I mean, you are looking at every aspect of your device and technology and how it fits within the market, how it's going to you know improve outcomes and in every aspect, patient, healthcare system. Um, but you know, again, you you've you've got a pretty um keen focus here in the next six to 18 months on some some important milestones and and i guess what are those specific milestones that you need to accomplish here um in the next year or so oh man that's a good question um so i think you know one of the happiest things for the company over this weekend was winning most investable startup award at m2d2 and finishing up cohort six and um you know, I'm not just saying that, but the the mentors at M2D2 and the, the education we got really helped us to say, all right, I like our plan, um, which is which is a hard thing to say in the startup world, right? Like you sit down with your team for weeks on end and you build this plan and then you execute on it. And nobody's there saying anything to you other than like, hey, good stuff. <laughs> um, so it's it's nice to, to have those experiences. And I'd say that was a really big milestone to, to finish that development of our plan. And so moving forward right now, the first thing that's coming up, hopefully, you know, the end of this week, early next week would be the release of our study data. So we just finished up our first pivotal study. It was with a pain medicine clinic in New Hope, Florida. Sorry, Homestead, Florida called New Hope. I always get that backwards. But um, getting that study data out, really excited about this because, uh, you know, I, it went off without a hitch. Um, all of our patients reported no issues with the device, really liked the usability of it. Um, we're starting to look at the data right now, but everything was positive there. So doing our best to blow that up and get that out there. Then next stage would be looking at clinical trials. So setting up clinical trials with William and Mary, University of Delaware, and then the VA, like I said, and a couple goals here, right? To see if we can incentivize adherence, but also to establish a baseline. And so you guys were talking about problems and, and you know, what are the hurdles we're going to face as a company? One of the biggest hurdles, shockingly to me, is how good are we? And we can't really establish that right now because we don't know medication adherence of anyone. Um, outside of saying like, all right, you were prescribed 12 prescriptions in a year and you picked up eight and you're at 66% adherence. There's not a lot of granularity here. So how do we establish that baseline? The clinical trials will help us do that. And that's because we'll have a control and a test group and looking at that. And they'll go a long way in reporting our ability to prove outcomes to the FDA as well. But then entering the market and really having a focus on those mental health patients. And really, I guess, something that Joe and I have talked about in the past, but, but to quantify the outcomes is something that all too often I don't see in healthcare. And so that's what I would like to see in the next 12 months. By the end of 2024 is to have a quantified outcome to say, okay, we set out on this mission to help young adult mental health patients. And have we, how have we done that? You know, how many adverse events did we see in real time and prevent, or how many patients did we help get on a better treatment plan? Mm -hmm. And then from there, I would say the real focus is on just scalability. Um, so one of the milestones that I think about is just the internal check mark of yes, we have it all set up administratively and come to the end of this year so that if we had a new big patient come in, um, Advent Health in Florida is one that comes to mind because they have some 20 million patients. So talk about landing a hospital system, that'd be that'd be a big deal. But like if we did do that, how do we service that product order and how do we service that customer and you know, really have a white glove approach to that so that what we're doing is a benefit to everybody in the mix. I think that's something that, you know, it's not like a finish a trial at William & Mary, but it, it's a very serious milestone in the sense that when we come to VC due diligence and look to raise a Series A at the end of this year and get some serious capital behind the, the company, we need to be buttoned up. And, and I think that's something that I learned through the cohort is often overlooked. Um, and so it, it's worth it to spend those long weekends to organize, you know, your drive and make sure all the documents are in the right spot. And 
if the FDA came to talk to me today, could I be audited and things like that? That's probably the the thing I think about most, right? As the CEO running it, it's not what are the real positive outcomes and milestones we've accomplished, but like what are the risk mitigation strategies that we have in place and how do we implement those to make sure in the worst case scenario, we're still moving the ball forward. Mm-hmm. And I think that administrative side of life is really important for us. Yeah, Alexander, a lot of great mile, milestones here, you know, super hyper focused with your efforts um, over these next six to 12 months. Um, and, you know, you mentioned maybe some busy weekends and sleepless nights, uh, which is part of the grind. You know, we hear it all too often when we're talking to other founders in the space. And, you know, Richard, something that we always talk about is the importance of team. Alexander was touching on that. Um, but team, you know, is, is everything, you know? Yeah. And I, and I should add as well, like, you know, you touched on your co-founder, Joe there. I think we should really bring him into the conversation and everyone else who's involved in this process and the journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I started the company with Joseph White, who's, who's the co-founder and really just oversees development from start to finish. I, uh, I think about this guy so much because, I mean, he did a double major in college for Gov and Econ and was simultaneously sitting in the library building out, you know, on AutoCAD, a, a mechanical design and printing it in college. And so it wouldn't have ever gotten here without him. Um, and moving forward till today, I think the biggest aspect of a team that changed rapidly and was a tough transition, but we got through it was that it was always just me and Joe, right? Learning how to delegate and manage and trust. Yeah, we can throw away delegation and management. Trust is the key of a team, right? To say, all right, I'm not going to do it. You are. And I trust that you'll do a good job. That was that was something that was really difficult to overcome. But I would say now, you know, that was about a year and a half ago when we first had those those conversations. And today we have a chief technology officer, James McCann, who's working for us full time. And um managing all of our information architecture, data in, data out, and the front end visualizations for all of our patients and physicians. And what a weight off, because I mean, he's accelerated the timeline significantly. He's brought some real experience to the team. He's helped us understand the relationships of advocacy groups and PBMs, pharmaceutical companies, how everybody plays into this mix. So having him on the team has been just exceptional. And um and it helped us really hammer out who does what. And so getting that clear delineation of responsibilities is, is so important. And we've also brought on some other people. Um, Hirsch Patel is our clinical advisor right now and really doing a lot to help us understand with pain medicine and psychiatric care what patients need from us. And then, um, like I said, I'm a team guy, but uh, you know, I would say one of the biggest benefits any startup has is their investor advisory network. So we have pretty regular meetings with everybody to ask them questions and bounce ideas off of them and, and to say, you wrote us a check. So if you'd like to defend your investment, please, you know, this is an issue the company's facing. There's no real reason to hide the problems in my mind. It's always about, here's a problem. Let's fix it faster with your help. But all that being said, I would say the other thing that's really important to Cosmos and we do a lot with our team is education. I never liked the idea of Jim totally understanding AWS and Joe not knowing how to log into it. And I never liked the idea of Joe being the only person that could order devices and talk to our suppliers. And likewise with me and the investors and customers, we're all overlapping so that we all can do each other's job in some capacity. Not that we could manage the database like Jim can, but but if somebody needs a data package, we could get it to them. And things like that are really important so that nobody feels like, oh, he's gone and now we're just standing still and we can't move forward without them. Um, Because life hits hard. And I think that's another thing in a startup world people don't really talk about too much, but like things happen and the team's not always together, but the team always functions. And I think that's, that's important to think about. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, you know, Richard, I I just want to jump in because um, Alexander's doing a great job here reflecting you know, on a lot of aspects of the company and technology and and where Cosmos is today and where they're going in the future. And Alexander, you know, we clearly know what motivates you and you're obviously very passionate. Clearly you had a major life experience early on with your buddy and I know it was tough, um, but you know, you can tell that that motivation, it just, 
it's oozing out of you, man. You are very passionate and, you know, your focus on team and trust. It's all powerful stuff, man. I guess kind of if there was, you know, maybe a, a piece of advice uh, that you'd have for maybe other aspiring founders um, that want to bring a medical device, a medical technology to market, I guess, you know, what would that be? I'd say all too often advice is theoretical. So I'll give, I'll give a piece of advice that's been the saving grace of my company is I have a notebook. Now I have on my third one. But looking back is something I would recommend doing in a very specific environment. Like, all right, today, Saturday morning, I'm going to sit down with my notebooks. I'm going to review all of the mistakes I've made. Because um, that's really what it is looking back, right? You're not like, oh, I never really celebrate the victories when I look back. It's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. But I would say writing notebooks down, not like the notes from every call, but just like, all right, this is the plan. This is what we're doing. This is what's going on. I, I'm able to go reference everything we've done. And so when somebody comes and says, hey, do you want to put your you know, product into the Brookstone magazine? We're going to have a massive mental health issue coming out. I can reference the notebook and be like, no, we're not doing this. This is something that has nothing to do with our market, but it's a cool opportunity. Um, and likewise with development teams and the mistakes I've made hiring and firing people and management and mismanagement, I would say that keep a notebook as the CEO, diligently write in it and reference it, but don't reference it in a negative way of like, I can't believe I'm an idiot and I made that mistake. Like I look back very infrequently and very seriously when I look back, it's like, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to do it as a team. We're going to review the mistakes and then we're going to forget about them and move forward. But that balance of not looking back until you need to and then moving forward once you know the mistakes you've made, that's been really, really valuable for the team too. Yeah, I've always had a sense, Alexander, the times that we've spoken um, about your incredible leadership. And I think that's a, a testament to your, your leadership because um, that is a unique answer. That's something that we're not hearing you know, that often on the show. Um, and I think kind of reflecting back and, and being able to look at the decisions that were made along the way and in an effort to be focused, to learn, but to keep going, I mean, spot on, man. So that is huge. Um, really appreciate that. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's an exciting vision too now here, uh, Richard, yeah. you know, that's a big part. Absolutely. But to your point, Carl, that's just such sound advice and something Alexander and I have had a long conversation around is, you know, how you take on that advice and how you develop processes, because I think what's coming through loud and clear is the fact that you're very process orientated and you're able to write things down and actually give it some deep thought. You know, why are we doing something? And again, back to that thing, you know, sometimes the hardest word to say is no. And you're clearly thinking about, you know, why are you doing something before you make that decision, which I think is ultra important. So yeah, Kyle asked um, or mentioned there around vision and it's something we always like to discuss so as we close things out here is if you were to look ahead in five, 10 years time, you know, what is that vision for Cosmos? I think what I would like to see in the future is a relationship between a patient and a physician where the patient has total access to their medical record, their understanding of their treatment plan, why they're doing something and what the risks they face are. And that last one is where Cosmos comes into the mix, right? We're certainly not going to be able to handle all of that. But but to your point of, you know, being process oriented and how I make decisions, risk management is critical. And so I think for everybody in America, if we could have a better understanding of the risk a patient faces on a day-to-day -day basis with day-to-day -day changes, that's where I would see the best impact of my company in, in the country. And so helping patients understand the risk is really where I see my company coming into play. And that's the vision I'd like to say is just at a high level, can we better educate patients so they can make risk management and informed decisions? That'd be awesome. That's that's what I would like to have take place. That's a great vision, Kyle. And I'm sure that's something everyone listening can rally around and support. Yeah, and if they do want to support you, Alexander, how do they get a hold of you? Oh, there's a lot of ways. Our website's fortiscap.com, F-O-R-T-I-S-K-A-P. But I think the easiest way and the most frequently thing checked thing I do is uh, LinkedIn. You know, Alexander Colton on LinkedIn, you're going to find me pretty quickly. Find Cosmos Pharmaceuticals page, find Joseph White's page or James McCann and reach out. Um, that's the best way to get in touch. Awesome. Yep. Well, you know what? You're, you're an amazing person. You're a tremendous leader. 
Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there um, that might want to join you on your journey and support your journey one way or another, um, maybe even from a, a funding and financing piece too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexander, for joining us today and sharing the Cosmos mission. Again, I think this is something we can all get behind and support given how it impacts so many people's lives. Yeah, Richard, Kyle, thank you so much for your time today and inviting me onto the podcast. It's been a, been a great time here with you guys. Yeah, appreciate it, Alexander. Thank you. And uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, another huge thank you to Alexander Colton, co-founder and CEO of Cosmos Pharmaceuticals. Um, thank you for tuning in for another episode of the MedTech Impact Podcast. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikkeljohn. Until next time, keep innovating. Oh, my God.